Dr. Abbott. Good afternoon. Mr. Luckman and I welcome you to another discussion of the great ideas. We continue today the discussion of art. And I hope we can concentrate this afternoon on the fine arts. There are many interesting problems connected with the fine arts that I should like to discuss. But first, I would like to return to a point we did not complete last week. Last week, I tried to present to you three basic distinctions in the arts, and I only succeeded in dealing with two. First, the distinction between the cooperative arts and the simply productive arts, an art like farming on the one hand and like shoemaking on the other. And then, a distinction between the useful and the fine arts, art which produce things that serve a purpose or a function, and the fine art which produce things which are beautiful, uh, whose aim is to delight the persons who behold them, to give pleasure in beholding. Now, there's a qualification on that distinction between the useful and the fine arts I, I want to remind you of as I go on. A useful work may delight as well as serve a purpose. For example, fine furniture may give delight to the eye, and a, a building, a work of architecture, may be useful but also delightful. And on the, on the other hand, a work of fine art, a work of fine art such as a painting, or a, a novel, or a piece of music, may, in addition to being delightful, a thing of beauty, may be useful as well. But the point is that if something is merely instructive, instructive, useful in the sense of teaching, uh, then it is not a work of fine art. For example, uh, I think of Euclid's Elements of Geometry. To me, Euclid's Elements of Geometry is a thing of beauty, but it's not primarily so. It's primarily instructive, and that is why I would call it liberal art, not fine art. This brought us to the third distinction we were concerned with last week between the liberal and other arts. Lloyd, do you recall the question I was answering when time ran out? Oh, very well, indeed was the question from Mother Anne of the Ursuline School in Santa Rosa, I believe. And she was asking you, in terms of the liberal arts, uh, what was the meaning of the term liberal arts as we use it today in colleges, liberal arts colleges. And you pointed out that uh, while we call these colleges liberal arts colleges, uh, they're more teaching useful arts yes, than indeed. liberal arts. And then you went on with the distinction between uh, liberal arts and... Well, uh, the distinction between the liberal arts and the servile arts. Let me make that distinction now, Lloyd. Let me say first what the meaning of servile is. Uh, an art is servile if it makes something out of matter, and the thing which is made exists in matter. It is called servile because in the ancient world, where this name originated, only slaves got their hands dirty and calloused. Only slaves worked in matter. Most useful works, most material products of art, are in this sense, servile. They're made in matter, and they exist in matter. The meaning of liberal, on the other hand, is free, free from having to deal with matter, made in the mind and exists in the mind. For example, a speech, a great speech, exists in the human mind. A mathematical demonstration is made in the human mind and exists, therefore, there. And that is why these works, a speech or a mathematical demonstration, is called a work of free art, liberal art. And this is what gives the name, Lloyd, to our traditional seven liberal arts, of which I'm only going to name three, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. These arts make works in the human mind. But these arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, are useful arts, not fine arts. They are liberal but useful arts, as the art of teaching is. Hence, we have the, the, the interesting question. What about the fine arts? Are the fine arts servile or are they free? Are the fine arts servile or are they free? Now, my answer to this question may seem shocking at first. The answer is some of the fine arts are free and some of the fine arts are servile. For example, literature and music are free arts. Uh, and the, re how, the way we know that they're free is that all that's physical about them are the notation by which the art is conveyed from the mind of the artist, the work of art from the mind of the artist, to the mind of the audience. Uh, I'm thinking of literature now, and music, for example, without regard to the, the, the auxiliary arts of the performer, the stage actor necessary to produce a play, or the, the orchestra necessary to play a piece of music. For example, here in this book is poetry, is poetry. And its only physical existence is in words. But that is, that's, that those words are merely 
there to convey the poem from the mind of the author to the mind of the reader of the poem. It doesn't, the, the poem doesn't exist there on the page. Or take this piece of music, take a piece of music. These notations, these musical notations are not the music. And you don't have to play the piece of music to have the piece of music because a person who is competent in reading music can by reading the notations actually hear in the inner ear, have the physically unheard but imaginatively heard music that the composer intended. It is in this sense that arts like poetry and like music are said to be free because they are made in the mind and can exist in the mind. But let's consider fine arts which are not free in this sense. For example, the arts of painting and sculpture. Consider for a moment with me this reproduction of the statue. The original of this statue exists somewhere in the world in one place only, in a museum. If this statue is to be seen by anybody who doesn't go to that museum, we must make actual models of it, reproductions of it. This reproduction of the statue is not like the notes in a, on a page of musical score or like the words in a book. It convey, has to convey the statue by actually physically reproducing it. That shows that the statue is, in a sense, a servile work. It has to be made in matter and exist in matter. Let me just add, by the way, that Leonardo da Vinci, the great painter, was very sensitive to this distinction between the liberal and the servile arts. He regarded painting as more liberal than sculpture because the painter could be in his studio with a fine velvet jacket and his hands could be kept clean, whereas the sculptor was covered by the dust of chipping mar marble and his hands got dirty and calloused. That's why Leonardo thought painting was a more liberal art than sculpture. Let me take another art to illustrate the point. Let's take the ballet. Is the ballet free or servile? Well, it's changed. At one time, the ballet necessarily was servile art because the ballet could only be produced on the stage by these actors using their own bodies to produce it, these dances. But now, in recent years, the, the, the notations of choreography have been developed. And these notations enable the dance, the ballet, to exist on paper in symbols just as music exists on paper in symbols so that a person who could read the choreography could, under, could actually imaginatively reconstruct the dance without having to go to the theater to see it. Let me see if I can summarize this now, then in a chart which shows you the division between the liberal and the servile arts in relation to the fine and to the free arts. In this chart, above the line, I have put the arts which are fine arts. Below the line, the arts which are useful arts. And among the fine arts, literature, all forms of fictional writing, imagined literature or poetry, music and choreography are typical free arts, whereas typically servile but fine arts are painting, sculpture, and the actually staged ballet. Below the line, I have the useful arts, and pardon the misspelling of grammar, the, the typewriter slipped, as typewriters sometimes do, here are the three liberal useful arts, free useful arts of grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And here, over here, are three useful but servile arts. Architecture, which is the most liberal of the useful servile art, but nevertheless, the building has to exist in matter. It doesn't exist in the architect's plans, and an art like carpentry, and perhaps most servile of all, is the art, that, the art that most women practice every day of their lives, the art of cosmetics, which they have to get their hands dirty, perhaps a little bit. Uh, to perform the art of cosmetology. Now, in that summary, Dr. Yes, Adler, yes, Lloyd. I'm missing something that you were stressing very much last week and you haven't mentioned today. Remember the cooperative arts of farming and medicine yeah. and uh, teaching? Uh, how do they fit in? Well, uh, I should have mentioned them. The cooperative art of farming is a useful art and servile. Actually, the farmer has to deal with the soil and the, and the things of the soil. The cooperative art of teaching is like grammar, rhetoric, and logic, a liberal, useful art. And medicine, partly dealing with the body and partly with the mind or soul, is partly free and partly servile. Let me get back now. Let me get back now to the, the problem that bothers me. Because I'm, it may bother you too. Aren't you bothered? As I, I can't get over being bothered by the fact that the, you have a sense that the fine arts should all of them be free. Uh, if new literature and music and the choreography of the ballet give you free 
fine arts, why aren't all the others free? Ah, that's a hard question to answer. In a sense, perhaps they are free, even though they must exist in matter, as the statue exists in the stone, or the, the, the painting exists on the canvas. Perhaps, in the deepest sense, the fine arts do not exist except in the mind of the beholder. In this sense, then, they exist in the mind and are like free arts. Now, whether or not such freedom, freedom from matter, characterizes all of the fine arts, I'm going to go on and give you three characteristics which are common to all the fine arts and distinguish them from useful art. Let me just read you what this chart says and then comment. In the first place, a work of fine art has individuality. In the second place, a work of fine art is original. In the third place, a work of fine art says something. Now, let me talk briefly about each of these three points. A work of fine art, we say, has individuality. What does this mean? It's a most astounding fact. Every work of fine art has a proper name. It either has a title or an opus number, or a number of production, as in the case of a print, which is this numbered print. You don't, you don't name shoes, you don't name desks, you don't name uh, fountain pens or clocks. Among, in the work of, in the work, among works of useful art, only extraordinary things like great trains or great ships are given proper names. Why is this so? When we give a proper name to something, we are giving it personality. We do personify trains and ships, of famous trains and ships. And every work of fine art, which has a proper name, its own individual name, therefore is regarded by us as having more personality than any useful thing has. Secondly, we say that every work of fine art is original. What do you mean by this? Well, in all these letters we've been receiving in the last few weeks, people have talked about the creative arts. Uh, the useful arts aren't creative, they say. The meaning of that is that a work of fine art is creative in the sense of being original. It is not a duplication of anything else, not a reproduction. Here it is. This, for the first time, is this thing produced, you see. And somehow the combination of these two, the individuality and the originality of the work of fine art, give it its unique character. Now I come to the third characteristic. A work of fine art says something. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that a work of fine art says something? I'll never forget, in my youth, when I heard musicians talking, I heard one musician saying to another about a piece of music, oh, I don't think that's very good. It, it, it says so little. It says so little. And I said to myself, well, what can that musician mean by saying of a piece of music, it says so little? I didn't think it said anything at all. And then I realized, as I, the more I thought about the arts, I realized that that was the deepest remark I'd ever heard made. Every one of the fine arts is a kind of language. Not like our verbal speech, the kind of speech I'm using now, but a language of its own. A language which says only certain things. Now, let's ask that question again. What is it that a work of fine art says? What is the meaning of its content? To answer that question, I say you have to think of each of the great fine arts, music, poetry, all the rest of literature, painting, sculpture, as in terms of the medium in which the work of art is produced, a language, a kind of speech utterly different from the ordinary speech of everyday discourse, because it is a speech which says certain things and only certain things. If we look at the fine art this way, we can reach a classification of the fine art as so many different languages, each language in its own medium, a special mode of communication or expression. Let me give you, in another chart now, a classification of the fine art looked at this way, in terms of them, as each of them, a very special language. In this classification, I first made a distinction, which I'll come back to, between fine arts which are in motion, which are in time, which take time for them to exist, and fine arts which are motionless. In the fine arts which are in motion, let me take literature and music. The language of literature is not necessarily just words, but it's what the words evoke, the images, the whole imagination, emotional and intellectual imagination that is evoked by the symbols of literature. Just as the language of music is the language of tone and time. These are, these are the elements out of which music is composed, tones and time, the elements of rhythm uh, and, and temporal structure in music. And the language of music is in terms of the grammar, if you will, of these elements. And so the language of the plastic arts, arts like painting and sculpture, is a language in terms of visible forms, 
forms that have to be seen. Forms, visible shapes and colors and patterns that have to be seen to express what the painter or sculpture is trying to say. Now, that classification uh, is only exemplary. Well, uh, if it's only exemplary, then I think I can bring in this question at this point, because we have a very interesting letter here from Mr. Peterson in Oakland. Yes. And uh, he wants to know uh, about photography. Is the photographer an, an artist? And I'd like to know, since you mentioned ballet a moment ago, along with Mr. Peterson's question, where would you put ballet, well, photography and ballet, then? Well, I, I would say, in the first place, that photography is a plastic art. Uh, it, 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 its works exist uh, in the visible forms that they contain. Uh, as for ballet, ballet looks like a plastic art. It, it contains a visible moving form, but looking a little deeper into the content of ballet, you see that ballet is an art in time. It's not a, not a, a motionless art. It's an art in motion, and therefore it has more affinity to music and poetry, to narration and drama, and, and drama than it does to uh, the simple motionless plastic. As a matter of fact, the, the art of the motion picture, one of my favorite arts, the art of the cinema, partly plastic in the fact that it uses pictorial, a pictorial medium in part, but not entirely. Nevertheless, an art in motion, the main point of which is storytelling. The only plastic art in motion that I can think of, truly plastic art in motion, that isn't, isn't like poetry or music, uh, is the new art of creating mobiles, actually moving visible forms which the motion of which is part of the art. Now, uh, let me get back to my main question, Lloyd, which is about the different fine arts as so many languages. And the question I want you all to think about, as hard as you can think about it, is this question. Do they all say the same thing? Can you translate what one art says into another art? Can you say, oh, this in music says what this says in painting, what this says in poetry? Think of that question for a moment before you hear my answer. Is the meaning, the content, so I put it this way, is, is the, the la artistic language of one art capable of translation into the artistic language of another, as French, for example, is translatable into English or French into German? The answer would at first appear to be yes, because the arts have a certain kind of common content. Uh, they, they, they all refer to an objective world in which we live, which is common. They all somehow express common thoughts and feelings. So you'd think, think the answer would be yes. Of course you can translate, just as you can translate from French into German or German into English. But no, deeply and more really, the answer is no. And the reason why the answer is no is because in the fine arts, the content can never be divorced from the form, the form given to it by the medium of communication, which is the language of that fine art. Let me say it another way. You, you get a sense of this, you get a sense of this when you recognize that to translate English prose into French prose is easy. But why do people say, well, French poetry, French verse, can't be translated into English verse? Because they're in poetry, not prose. Something about the actual language and the imagery that language contains is not translatable into another foreign language. Now, there's a deep mystery here. I think this is the deepest mystery about the fine arts. The fact that there is something common to all of them, which we can never express in words, or can never, can never express what one art says in another. There is a kind of ineffability about the art which makes it impossible to translate from one to another. Yet, for most people, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use a hard word here, the popular and the almost the vulgar approach to the fine arts is to transgress this mystery, to avoid this mystery, not to be sensitive to this mystery. Most people, when they look at plastic paintings and, and plastic works, paintings and sculpture, do no more than read the story off it, say it in words. And when they do this, they are, in a sense, violating that mystery. And I think, as a matter of fact, that you can see how, you, you can actually see this done. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me take an example here. Let's take this very famous statue. Most people looking at it, knowing the title, would say, "Why, well, yeah, that, that's a boy taking a thorn out of the sole of his foot. And having said it in words that way, they might be satisfied that they had seen the statue, whereas, in fact, all they had done was taken a story from it. Or to take another example, let me show you 
a famous painting appropriate on this Easter day, a painting by Caravaggio, a painting by Caravaggio, which uh, is, is the, most people looking at would only see the story, the great Christian story of Christ being taken down from the cross. Or to take another painting that they also would read that way is a, a painting by Fra Angelico, a painting by Fra Angelico, which is the painting of the entombment of Christ. Again, reading the title and knowing the story, they would not see the picture. They'd be satisfied merely with this literary equivalent, with saying in words what the picture seemed to narrate. It is precisely this vulgar approach to the fine art, particularly the fine art of painting, translating it into literary terms, that modern, the modernist revolt towards abstraction and surrealism in art was a, 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 an answer to, a quarrel with, an attempt to overcome. Let me see if I can show you this by showing you some modern paintings and make the point almost in the artist's own terms. First, look at, with, with me at this Picasso. Now, what will disturb you about that when you see it is the fact that it bears a title, and the title is The Three Musicians. All right, now, look next with me at a picture by, a very famous one, by the surrealist painter Dolly. And what disturbs people about that, again, is the title. The title of that picture is A Chemist Lifting with Precaution the Cuticle of a Grand Piano. Or again, look with me now at a picture by Mondrian. A picture by Mondrian. Here's the picture. And the title of that is Broadway Boogie Woogie. Or once again, one more picture, please. A picture here, a very famous one, one of the most famous of all, the picture by Duchamp, picture by Duchamp, entitled Nude Descending a Staircase. Now, let me make my point. These titles, these titles themselves express the artist's defiance. It is to say, you no, know, you're not looking at the picture. You're, listening, you're reading the title and trying to find in the picture what the title says. You can't do it, says the artist. And the way to illustrate that most clearly to you is to look at one more picture here, a picture by Kadinsky, which is no different from the others, no different from Broadway Boogie Woogie, but here Kadinsky puts the title on it, which doesn't disturb anybody. The title of this picture is Circles in Circles. And anyone looking at it says, well, yes, Circles in Circles. And my point is, my point is that modern art, modernist revolt is an attempt to overcome the literary interpretation of the plastic arts, and the same thing is true of music. But this modernist revolt calls our attention to what for me is the deepest issue about the fine arts, the problem of imitation and creation in the fine arts. Now, if you're going to talk about imitation, can I stop you for a moment, Dr. Adler, because I have a question here. And this particular problem uh, is whether or not uh, you have imitation in good art or, or not. Um, I would appreciate some consideration, says this uh, writer, Mr. Cartmill, Mr. Cartmill yes. uh, of the question dealing with the imitative nature of art. I'm wondering what role imitation plays in the creation of a work of art. Mr. Cartmill, imitation and creation supplement each other. They belong together. As I see it, imitation in the work of fine art signifies that which the artist draws from the object, the world of nature. Whereas creation in a work of fine art signifies that which the artist draws out of his own soul or mind. But these two things fuse because in drawing something from the objects of nature, the artist, if he's an artist, must transform it subjectively. And in drawing something out of his own, own soul or mind, the artist, if he's an artist, must objectify it, put it in the object which is the work of art produced. Hence, artistic imitation is not simply uh, copying, reproducing a mere photographic image. Artistic imitation is creative imitation. And artistic creation is also imitative creation. And the reason for this, not pure creation any more than imitation, is mere copying. And the reason for this is that only God is a pure or absolute creator. Man is derivatively a creator, a, an imitative creator. That is why 
the human artist must borrow from nature. There's a magnificent remark by the great French painter Delacroix, which is that nature is simply a dictionary. Think of that a moment. Nature, for the painter, is simply a dictionary. It's as if, for a writer, the words are there, but he must compose the poem from the words. So nature provides something like, in its visible forms and shapes and colors, the dictionary, the words of painting, but the artist taking those words, if you will, the analog of words, the elements of the, the plastic speech of painting composes the picture or composes the statue. Hence, Mr. Cartmill, there is no conflict, I would say, between uh, creation and imitation in the fine arts. For fine art is both creative and imitative. But there is a deep tension between creation and imitation that produces two opposed tendencies in the fine art. The tendency towards representation on the one hand and the tendency towards uh, abstraction on the other. And this problem, Lloyd, I'd like to start off with next week, when we have more time. I'd like to begin next week with this deep and difficult problem of the opposed tendencies in the fine art uh, going towards abstraction on the one hand and representation on the other. And if I can finish that next week, I would also like to go on to the other problem of what is good and bad in the fine arts. What is morally good art and morally bad art? What is aesthetically good art and aesthetically bad art? I hope on these important and I think quite fascinating subjects, you will send in letters indicating what problems you would like to have us discuss as we next week conclude our discussion of arts with these basic themes about the fine arts. Thank you very much.